about the church in Uzbekistan. We must remember those in chains as if chained with them. And then recognize that in all likelihood, some of us will live long enough if Jesus tarries to become those in chains for the gospel. The good news, however, is that Jesus Christ, as we have sung today so wonderfully, he is Lord of all, over all, in all. Turning your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, looking at verses 35 to 40 today. As we think about Jesus asserting his messianic authority. And you're going to see him flexing his God-like muscles as we move closer to the cross until he simply surrenders himself into the hands of sinners. Mark chapter 12, verses 35 to 40. I hope you found that in your Bibles. If you don't happen to have a Bible, we'll have it on the screen for you. Stand with me if you would and follow along as I read this passage. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and had the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. I've just read to you, what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. Oh, may this passage grip us today to deliver us from the temptation every one of us has. You know there's a Pharisee living in my heart and in your heart. May the Lord deliver us from that. Help us to put him, put him to death. Put them to death. <laughs> And then also come to rest in the glorious truth that Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Thank you. Please be seated. I, I want to, uh, us to think this morning, you know, the passages we've studied up to this point recently, he has, Jesus has silenced uh, Mark, the last verse we read last week, they no longer asked him any questions. He has silenced the antagonistic religious leaders in their attempts to discredit him. Now he enters the temple area and he shows his superior exegetical skills in understanding and interpreting key old, a key Old Testament passage. He also exposes in this time uh, certain aspects of the hypocrisy of the scribes. And in doing these two things, he asserts his messianic authority. Look at the passage, if you will, with me under, under two headings. First, a question concerning how the Messiah can be the son of David, verses 35 to 37. And secondly, a warning about the hypocrisy of the scribes. Look at this question that he poses. Verse 35 tells us, as he was teaching in the temple, he said this, how can the scribes, so he's He's focused in on these, these scribes, the people who, who were, if, if the Pharisees were the experts in, in memorizing the law and, and in modeling the law, the scribes were the experts in, in being sure it, it was written down and, and passed on and in applying it. How can the scribes say that the Christ 
is the son of David. And that's what they would say. They, the, the Jewish lineage told them that, that Messiah would come from David, the promise that God had given in the Davidic covenant, that there, there will always be a son to sit on your throne. And they asserted that. They taught that. They, they gloried in that. That the one who would rescue the nations was one who would come from David's line and sit on David's throne. If you remember briefly your history, you know, David had quite a, a rule. It was, it was not uh, uncomplicated. It was not without its, its trauma and its problems. As he had children rise up against him to rebel against him, he himself committed grievous sins. And so one writer said that in the light of that, David limped home to glory. He made it home. The 23rd Psalm uh, teaches us that journey for him and his confidence in that journey, but he limped home. But it was a grand day for the people of God. They had initially gotten a king. They asked for a king. I told you this. They said, give us a king like the rest of the nations have a king. And that's exactly what God gave them. He gave them Saul. And then he deposed Saul. He removed the spirit from Saul and his favor from Saul. And David was anointed, the shepherd king, the shepherd boy, a very unlikely person. And yet quickly he rose to prominence as he, as he slew Goliath. I think our children taught, studied about Goliath today and, and, uh, and perhaps other classes as well. So, so you see this, this rise to power and the greatness of the Davidic reign. And, and then when, when David uh, stepped off the throne, went on to glory. The, it was passed on to Solomon. Solomon, a wise man. Uh, the wisest man that people had seen up until that time. And yet, yet foolish in some areas as well. And, and so there was, there was a time of splendor even in Solomon's reign, though, though it began to wane toward the end. And then, of course, you know after the reign of Solomon that the kingdom was divided between two of Solomon's sons. And, and things were not going well. And so the hope of the religious leaders in Jesus' day was that one would come to ascend to the throne of David, the Messiah, the Anointed One, the Christ would come, and he would ascend to the throne of David. He would, he would once again give to Israel royal and regal rule, and they would rule over the enemies of God, and, the, and the, the Romans and all would be put under their feet, that they would no longer be subjects to them, and the kingdoms would be brought back together, the twelve tribes united. That was their hope. That was what they were looking for. That's what they wanted and believed that Messiah would do. And so Jesus is posing this, this very interesting question to them. How is he the son of David? How is the Christ? And the, the word Christ, just remember quickly, is, it's not translated for us. It's transliterated. If you could see it in the Greek, it's the word Christos. And it simply comes over to us as Christ. It means anointed one. It is the, it is the Greek equivalent of the Old Testament Hebrew Messias, which we read Messiah. The scribes say that the, the Christ is the son of David. And then he cites Psalm 110. He says, but David himself calls him Lord. Look at Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Now, what you need to realize, I don't know if, you're, if your texts reflect this or not. The first use of Lord is Yahweh, or Jehovah. The I Am the God who revealed himself to Moses, the God whose name speaks of his covenant with his people. He is the one who was, who is, who is to come. And he reveals himself as Yahweh, the one who will keep his covenant with his people. The, so God, the covenant keeper, says to Adonai, that's the second use of Lord. So when we read the English, it says, the Lord said to my Lord. Well, they're two different words. Sometimes the translations will, will do an all caps type of Yahweh. 
capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D will mean Yahweh. He said this to Adonai. Well, Adonai is, and we've been studying this on Wednesday nights, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful study, by the way, just to, just to bask in the names that God has revealed concerning himself and then to pray to him in the light of that. Adonai is the name for God, which was used as a substitute for Yahweh 364 days of the year. One day a year for the Jews on, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, could they pronounce the name. In fact, they, they spoke of the, of the name Yahweh as the divine this is, a, this is a long, multisyllabic word here. The divine tetragrammaton. In other words, the divine four-lettered word. And they wouldn't say it. I, I think I may have told you this. I told the folks at prayer meeting. My Hebrew professor, Dr. David Garland, did some postdoctoral studies uh, at, at, a, at a university in the, in the Northeast. and He was in a class. And by the time you, by the time you get to that level, studying Hebrew, I mean, you can, you read it like you and I would read the uh, Owasso Reporter. I mean, you know, it's just, you just read it fluidly. And so they, they did a lot of reading in their classes. And he had in his class an Orthodox Jewish rabbi. They were reading through a passage, Dr. Garland told about this one day, and they came to the, to the divine tetragrammaton, they came to Yahweh. And so it was the rabbi's turn to read, and so when he came, he read, he read Adonai. And the professor stopped him and said, well, Rabbi, I said, the word is Yahweh. Read that again, please. And so he read it again and said, Adonai. And so, so Dr. Garland was watching this, and, and he knew what was going on. The, this place they were studying, the, 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 the teacher in the class was not particularly an evangelical. And so he said, Rabbi, with all due respect, the word is Yahweh. And the rabbi looked at him and said, Professor, with all due respect, on this day, the word is Adonai. Because it wasn't Yom Kippur, it wasn't the Day of Atonement when he'd be allowed to pronounce it. And so, so what's the point of that? Well, what you have going on here is Jesus is citing a passage. By the way, Psalm 110 verse 1 is, is either quoted or alluded to 33 times in the New Testament. It is a critical messianic psalm. And Jesus points out a conversation going on between God and someone else who is God. What he's doing is showing that the scribes who are supposed to be the ones who apply the Old Testament have here simply cited. I want to give you an example of how this is used. Just look at Psalm 8, verse 1, real quickly, just to, just to let you see. The psalmist begins to exclaim the majesty of God. Oh, and I'm going to read it as it would appear in the original. Oh, Yahweh, our Adonai, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. In other words, this word Adonai speaks of the sovereignty of God. He is, he is the sovereign God when you see Adonai. We'll see another, another name when we, we're going through on Wednesday nights. We'll come to Jehovah Sabaoth, the uh, the Lord of the captain of the host of, of all the armies. But here we're speaking of the sovereign rule. O oh, covenant keeping God, our sovereign God, how majestic is your name and all there. So you would see the use of it there. The point is that it would be in a positive. It would say, O oh, Jehovah, who is sovereign. O oh, covenant God, who is sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. And so you hear, though, in the psalm we're looking at, for the moment, Jesus is pointing out that the psalmist David cites a conversation. The Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, said to my Lord, one who, is, who rules over me. Now, in the Hebrew mindset, who rules over King David? King David is the archetypical king. When he was king, no one, well, Absalom thought he could rule over him, and he was, he was put down in the rebellion. But, but, but no one thought in terms of there being King David and a higher king except 
for his God. So King David said that Yahweh said to my Adonai, to my ruler, to my sovereign, sit at my right hand until I make my enemies, your enemies, your footstool. Now what Jesus has done here is he's asked a question at this point that's not a question. He starts out with a question. Why do the scribes say that Messiah, that Christ is the son of David, when David himself says that Messiah is his Lord? See, the question that's left unasked is how can this be? Now in John chapter 8, you may recall that he has this encounter with the Pharisees and, and he talks about if they, were, if they were sons of Abraham, they would believe him. And uh, then finally he asserts, before Abraham was, I am. I existed before Abraham. So what he's done here is with, without asking the question, the question is there. How can this be? How can the son of David be David's Lord? And the answer you and I know, there's only one answer, and that is for the son of David to have pre-existed David. And that means you must look to the heaven, and Jesus has been talking about previously that he has, that there's no one who's gone into heaven the way he will go except one who has come from heaven, that is him. Now we're told here that the crowd delighted and what he said, they, they'd never heard that. It gave them pause. Something to think about. What, how, how can that be? How, how can Messiah be David's son and David's Lord? And what he was doing was opening up for them pathways to think about, to think outside the established Jewish box of Messiah. And so what he's done basically is has said to them, I know the scribes remind you of their authority. In fact, in fact, his description of them here uh, was pretty off-putting for the scribes. When he goes on and talks about them in verses 38 and following. So let's look at this. It's uh, this warning. Having questioned the authority of the scribes in their, in their application, or in this case, their failure to apply properly, he warns about the hypocrisy. And he says, verse 38, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces. Now, the... Uh, you see some of this in academia sometimes, I mean, depending on where a person is in his studies, if he's, if he's gotten a bachelor's or a master's. And you see it really when you get into the doctoral stuff. And I'll never forget uh, when I was at seminary and we would have graduation, that this, that's when the pomp and circumstance came out. And that's when the professors wore their colors, <laughs> you know. And, and, and the robes would be, would be just tremendous, some of them, and great uh, coloring in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the cowls that fl flowed down. And, and different things, and some of the some of the hats, some of the miters were very interesting. They were, you know, they were uh, almost like you were looking at Martin Luther walk through the door from the from the. Uh, and so, and they weren't. These professors were not doing it for. I don't think they were being prideful about it. Uh, they were just wearing the colors of their where they had studied and graduated. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees. These guys. These guys were known for their robes. And uh, and the length of them. Uh, and the scribes particularly, if you read about them, their robes flowed on the ground. Now, just parenthetically, there, there, was, there was no small challenge in the laundering of these things because they walked on, on dusty and dirty roads most of the time, but, but their robes would flow to the ground. And Jesus says they like to walk around in long robes. 
and like greetings in the marketplaces. Oh, Rabbi, yes, hello. How about, yes, yes, good, yes, bless you. you. That's what they like to do. They like to be seen. They like to, to uh, put on airs. They like people to recognize their, uh, their place. They were authorities, by the way. You had a question about the, the Old Testament? Come see me. And Jesus exposes this for what it is. You see, Messiah comes humbly. These fellows who would strut around like peacocks were supposed to be the ones communicating to the people the hope of a coming Messiah. And one of the reasons they have such a hostility to Jesus is he didn't come out of their ranks. The scribes don't like him because he didn't, he didn't grow up in their schools. The Pharisees don't like him because he, he has, wasn't in their schools. The Sanhedrin don't like him because he's not sat at their councils, been approved by them to sit on the Sanhedrin. I mean, shouldn't you first have to sit on the Sanhedrin council before you can be elevated to Messiah, for crying out loud? The Sadducees didn't like him. He was way too conservative for them. And he was doing things that no one could explain. They tried to, they tried to call the man born blind on the carpet and say, tell us about this man. This, this fellow that you say healed you. If you read the John 9 passage closely, you, you realize what they're suggesting is we think you've been faking it all these years. We think you have been able to see and you've just been pulling one over our eye, a wool over our eyes and now you've come forth saying you can see. We think you're a fraud and we think this guy in it with you is a fraud. That's, that's what's going on without them saying it completely. Because when they press him, he says, he says you're, you're the teachers here and you don't know who he is? Why are you so curious? Do you want to become one of his followers too? They despise Jesus. And they've come to him with this series of questions trying to entrap him, trying, trying to expose him, trying to catch him, get him to slip. And he sends them away every time. And now, one writer said, he is going on the offensive now. He's exposed the scribes. To the crowd. By the way, the setting he's in, there's no doubt there were scribes in the area. There's no doubt there were Pharisees in the area. Uh, they loved to hang around the temple. I mean, it makes sense, doesn't it? He's exposed their exegetical inadequacies. Now he's exposing their pompous hypocrisy. And then he goes for the jugular. Because they have the best seats in the synagogues. By the way, if you, you and I attended synagogue in that day, just common folks like ourselves, we'd have been sitting on the floor. The scribes had the seats that were kind of bench seats around the wall. They didn't have to dirty themselves by sitting on the floor. They sat on the benches. And you could walk in and you would know immediately who, who the, the sure enough leaders were. They were sitting on the benches around the wall. They loved the best seats in the synagogues. Places of honor at feasts. Oh, Rabbi so-and-so's here. We can begin now. Blessings, Rabbi. Thank you for coming. Jesus said they love it. They love it. He's already dealt with this in Matthew's Gospel early on about they have to like to be seen of men who devour widows' houses. We know from James that, that pure religion and undefiled before God, that what God's, what God's heart beats after is the care of widows and orphans. I will, I'll never forget when I went to serve as senior pastor in a church. It was a, it was a historic church. It had been established in the early 19th century. We were talking about building plans and things like that. And the member said to me, well, if you'll go talk to widow so-and-so, she's, she's usually pretty good. If somebody will go to her, she'll, she'll usually pitch in some money for them. I thought, how upside down is that? You guys depend on the widows to grease the wheels here? So I told him, I said, I, will, I, I refuse. So now I'll go to minister to her. She's a widow, we'll care for her. See if she has any needs. And there was one widow, Karen will remember this, precious lady. So Karen and I would, she liked to go eat at a 
place called the Dinner Bell, fried eggplant. Never had eaten fried eggplant, but we delicious, by the way. And uh, we she we tried our best to pay for our, her meal. But you know, she was so grooved into the mentality that the church would come and expect from her that we never could, we never succeeded. And I, I slipped to the cash register and paid it one time. And she overruled it. I mean, it just, she just would not have it. She, could, she didn't think that way. I think, how awful. Pure religion and undefiled is to care for widows and to care for orphans. Jesus says the scribes devour widows' houses. Now you read that and you wonder, what is, you know exactly what was going on there. Husband had died, the widow remains, living in her home, you know what happened. The Pharisees would go, the scribes would go and say, you know, we, we have needs. You might say, you don't need this big house, your husband's gone. You could sell this and contribute to the synagogue. There, there, we have lots of ministries. Maybe they would get them to promise that when they when they died that that would go over to the church I mean, whatever however it manifested itself this is Jesus going for the juggler they devour widows houses they strut around the marketplace their robes flow they love to hear people call their names they sit in the best seats at synagogue they sit in the best places they're, they're the special guests at feasts so you have Jesus saying, you, you see the public ministry. You see their public face. But I want to tell you about their private face. Their private face is an abomination to God. They do not care for widows. They care for what widows have. And they want it. So much so that Jesus' description is they devour widows' houses. That's pretty graphic. They swallow them up. Spit out the widow so they can have the widow's house. And for a pretense. Now here, look folks. You think Jesus is not intense here? I mean, who of us? I cannot and dare not invade your prayer life. Whether you're praying publicly, whether you pray in prayer meeting, who am I? Jesus goes to the very soul of these people. And for a pretense, make long prayers. Now, he had already taught earlier in Matthew's gospel, they love to be heard and seen for their long praying. And so he's exposed their heart to people who could only see the externals. That's, that's what I said earlier. Oh God, deliver us from, from external religiosity. Because you see, while people may look at us and applaud, Jesus sees the heart. Man looks on the outside, God looks on the heart. What we ought to work on is to be sure that what is what is manifesting itself is flowing from a heart that loves God and loves others and wants to serve humanity because it is reflective of the heart of God. And then he makes an indictment. They will receive the greater condemnation. James said this in, in, in James chapter 3, verse 1, that not many of you should seek to be teachers because teachers are held to a stricter judgment. You see, those who dare communicate the truth in the name of God are held to a stricter judgment, not only for what they teach. They better teach truth and not intertwine truth and error so as to deceive and mislead the people. Not only for what they teach, Jesus chose here, but for what is in their heart what is in their heart. For the heart devotion they have for God. For the love they have. We looked last week at Jesus was asked, what's the greatest or the first or the 
most important commandment is to love God with all of your being. And what works out of that is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. That way when you love your neighbor, you're not trying to get your neighbor's things. You're not, you're, you see, you, you can't love your neighbor and covet your neighbor. Jesus teaches here that, that real religion is a heart matter. It's not a doing matter. It's a heart matter. It's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. By grace you've been saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It, the whole package, grace, salvation, faith, is the gift of God, not of works, so that no one can boast. The problem with these guys is they were boastful. You can almost picture them walking into an area and the people applauding and them going, give me more, give me more. So that no one can boast, for we are his workmanship, Paul says. Created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You see the flow. The flow. Saved by grace through faith. God is working in you. Paul would tell the Philippians, work out your salvation or work at your salvation with fear and trembling for it's God who's working in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's from the heart. It's heart religion. It's heart Christianity. Folks, there's, there's too much. and Our country is so messed up by what is setting itself forward as Christianity. That we, must, we must not go with that flow. We must be sure. We must guard our hearts. We must examine ourselves to see if we're in the faith. And then as we cultivate that heart relationship with the Lord, it will flow out. It can't stay in. You can't keep that in. You can, you can keep religion in. You can keep a lid on religion. You can control religion. You can guide religion. But a heart sold out to God cannot be controlled. It cannot be hidden. It. Jesus is calling for a real relationship with God. <laughs> Not one covered up with robes. Not one glossed over with fancy prayers. Because see, I believe this. I believe if we have a heart relationship with the Lord. Now people who are self-sufficient, self-contained, that, that doesn't attract them. But people who, who hurt, who are needy, they're drawn to that. And that's Jesus' indictment here, I believe. They will have the greater condemnation. Now, let's close it up. He is saying that to folks who were looking at him walking the earth and didn't know what they were seeing. We live 2,000 years on the other side of the cross in the empty tomb. We know full well who he was. We know what he came to do. We have confessed it. Do you think the judgment for the scribes will be stricter than the judgment for 21st century American churchianity? I tell you no. Do you think the hot hell reserved for Sodom and Gomorrah, for Chorazin and Bethsaida and Capernaum, is hotter than the hot hell reserved for 21st century Western churchianity? I tell you no. The hottest fires of hell are reserved for those who sin against more light. And so I, I read a passage like this and I say, oh dear God, search me. Search me. Try me. Know me. Discover me. Show to me what you discover in me that I might repent, be cleansed, and I've got, to, I've got to say to you people whom I love, I would, I would not be your pastor, I would not be your friend if I didn't say, search yourself. Examine yourself, whether you're in the faith. That's a, that's a biblical admonition. And as you discover that Pharisee, that scribe, put him to death and come into the, to the light, and a glorious relationship with God in the face of Christ as humble, humble sinners saved by grace. 
Jesus modeled that. Jesus rebuked his disciples when they tended to go the way of the prevailing religious culture and wanted to know who's going to be the first, who's going to be the... He rebuked that. And oh, may we learn from this. He's about to shift gears a little more. Having, having said what the scribes do to widows, he's going to then hold up a widow, a poor widow. It's closer to God than any of the religious teachers that they've been exposed to except him. He asserts his authority. Now that either should comfort us or it should make us tremble for Jesus to assert his authority. If we repent and draw near to him and trust in him, then no matter what comes our way in this culture, no matter, no matter who God serves up for us in November to lead us, he is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is over all. He is the ruler. And he will be with his people through wherever he takes us through. And we can have confidence in that. That's how our brothers and sisters in Christ around the world live every day and make it every day to know that no matter what authority holds them at, at knife point, gun point, sword point, a noose, a pyre to burn them on, that they live under the authority of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. If you don't know him here today, if you're not yet a follower of Christ, he would say to you, don't despise my authority. Submit to it. Yield to it. Confess Jesus Christ as Lord and come to him and find him to be the one who will be your advocate before the judgment seat of God. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We bow before you in Jesus' name. We, we bless you as we read this text. We marvel, we marvel when David, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus came on the scene, was taught by the Holy Spirit Yahweh said to Adonai, Come, sit at my right hand. Come and sit at the seat of authority until I, we put your enemies under your feet. Oh, dear God, may, may none of us here be found as the enemies of the Lord crushed under his feet. May we all be found children of God by grace through faith in Christ. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.